Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out tonight to uh, Dr. Kendall's lecture on dizziness and how it presents in the ER. We're very excited to have him yet again for another amazing lecture. Um, Dr. Kendall, uh, for those who don't know you, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katie, for having me and for the officers of the Raw CM Interest Group. It's always great to be able to talk to y'all. I am a former or Ross. Uh, I'm a Ross graduate myself. Graduated back in 2013, uh, and currently a, an emergency medicine physician here in Lubbock, Texas, where I am the clerkship director for our emergency medicine residency. Uh, and so great to uh, be able to talk with y'all and hopefully give you a, a little bit of information about a, a chief complaint that a lot of us in emergency medicine hate. <laughs> So awesome. Katie, is it okay if I go ahead and get started? Yeah, go right ahead. Oh, and he forgot to mention he's our uh, uh, clinical oh, yes. uh, faculty faculty advisor. <laughs> yes, the Ross oh. EMIG uh, faculty advisor. Yeah. So I'm very Thank happy to be you. that as well. So uh, so vertigo, I, you know, I, this lecture is a part of a bigger lecture that I do for the residents here at our program uh, where we have our neurology kind of core lecture. And this is one that I, really because of dizziness is so difficult um i specifically kind of sequestered this out of the entire neurology core lecture and spent a fair amount of time uh, on this topic for our residents and so hopefully you know i think all of us when we hear the word dizziness and our patient says that they're dizzy i think that this is what all of us look like right just kind of want to pull our hair out and not very happy with this, you know, trying to figure out, okay, was this dizziness something I have to worry about or not? So my hope is that after this lecture is done, you'll be zen with dizziness, that you will have a patient come in with dizziness and be like, oh no, this is all good. I, I know exactly what to do. So um, starting off just with a quick definition of vertigo, sensation of self-motion when no motion is occurring. And patients really have a difficult time describing, I'm dizzy though, is never an acceptable answer. So I want you to, if any time a patient says, I'm dizzy, no longer do you accept that as being an acceptable answer. You need to make them define what they mean by dizzy, right? I'm dizzy, no soup for you. You don't get that, sorry. That's, I'm dating myself with the Seinfeld uh, the references there. So um, when we talk about vertigo uh, in the setting of a patient who says they are dizzy, um, th there's a big differential here for all the things that could be causing that vertigo. Um, and so we have our peripheral causes of vertigo and our central causes of vertigo. For the peripheral causes, um, these are most of the time completely benign. And that benign in the emergency department means we don't care, right? I, I care about you, but I don't care that you've got this peripheral cause. It's nothing that I have to admit you for. It's nothing that I have to and, you know, uh, do any big workups on you for. It's something that I can treat symptomatically in the emergency department, discharge you home, and have you follow up with your primary care doctor. The central causes, on the other hand, are, are the causes that we do really care about because they can be life and limb threatening, right? So those things like a uh, cerebellar or brainstem stroke, a posterior circulation stroke, or cerebellar hemorrhage, all are big things that we do not want to miss. And so when somebody comes in and describing a sensation of vertigo, um, this is really what your main thing is. is you want to determine, is it a central cause or is it a peripheral cause? Um, when we, uh, just to kind of go back a second too. So th these, are the, these are the topics that are within for vertigo, but dizziness for most patients can also include what they describe as lightheadedness. So Lightheadedness and vertigo are both underneath that umbrella of dizziness. Uh, and so that's really where you have to get to that patient and say, okay, so this quote unquote dizziness that you're experiencing, is it a sensation of you feeling like you're going to pass out, like you're very lightheaded, or is it a sensation of the room spinning, or you feel like you are, you know, walking on the deck of a ship that's getting tossed in the ocean? If it's the lightheadedness version, then we go down a cardiac pathway, and that's a very that's kind of goes back to our whole chest pain lecture that we did before. And you kind of work up cardiac causes of lightheadedness, things like arrhythmia and and um, ACS and those type of things. 
Whereas if it's the vertigo, uh, that's, that's the room spinning or walking on a ship, then you go down this pathway of peripheral and central causes. So I'm not going to speak anything more about the lightheaded dizzy. This rest of this lecture is going to be about the neuro neurologic dizzy, that vertigo, because that is really the, the one that we all uh, are most concerned about. So the three most common causes of vertigo um, in the emergency department, it's benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV. I'm sure you've all heard of that. Then you also have vestibular neuritis and you've got uh, a cerebellar or brainstem stroke. So, you know, two of these, the vestibular neuritis and the BPPV, nothing that we really worry too much about. This one, the cerebellar brainstem stroke is the one that we are more concerned about. So with BPPV, most common cause of vertigo in all clinical settings, whether that's on family medicine or in emergency medicine, it's, um, it, it's the one that you're most commonly going to see. It's caused by that displacement of the otoconia, those little tiny stones inside your semicircular canals. And that can either be spontaneous or it can be due to a trauma or to infection. Um, in these scenarios, movement of the head will elicit vertigo and nystagmus. Again, while it's called positional, uh, because typically when the patients say, well, I, anytime I turn my head to the left, I get this vertigo sensation. And then as soon as I get my head straight and I'm looking at a, a fixed point, then it goes away. And it typically only lasts anywhere from about 20 seconds to two minutes. Um, the diagnosis here is with the Dix Hall Pike test, and then you can treat it with the Epley maneuver. I, the the Dix Hall Pike definitely do that in the emergency department. The Epley maneuver, I rarely do in the ER just because it, if you do it wrong, it can make their symptoms exponentially worse. So it's sometimes one of those things that I'll tell them, hey, go follow up with ENT and they'll do it in the office. Vestibular neuritis is a sec the second most common cause, uh, and it's a peripheral cause of vertigo. It's believed to be caused by a deficit in one of the um, vestibular nerves, um, and it uh, is likely caused by a virus. Uh, prolonged continuous vertigo that is intense for several days and then resolves over days, weeks, or months. The key word here is prolonged, okay? So remember with that BPPV, uh, if it'll let me go back. Remember, we're talking about 20 seconds to two minute episodes here, and then it goes away. This one is one that's constant and it doesn't go away. doesn't matter how you move, doesn't matter you know, what you're doing. It's going to be constant for days, weeks, months, um, you know, it's, or hours at least. And then there's no other associated symptoms. So no associated ear pain, there's no hearing loss, and there's no tinnitus, um, which can be seen in labyrinthitis and is a complication of acute otitis media. So again, just a way to kind of suss that out a little bit uh, when you're talking to your patient. The no hearing loss you'll see later becomes very important because if we start having hearing loss, then that makes us think more stroke than vestibular neuritis. And then for our cerebellar and brainstem stroke, and this of course is the most feared cause of vertigo. And the one that most of us as emergency medicine physicians are really concerned about missing. Um, mainly because our CT head and our CTA head and neck that we typically get on these, uh, you know, these acute stroke patients, it does not evaluate the cerebellum and the brainstem very well for these type of lesions. Uh, and so it's very easy to miss. Uh, many of these patients will present with neurologic symptoms like limb weakness, paresthesia, diplopia, which is double vision, dysarthria, but not always. Uh, the frequency of missed strokes in the emergency department when patients are discharged with a diagnosis of peripheral vestibular disorder is 0.41%. So it's not all that common. You know, I think we do a fairly good job of evaluating these patients appropriately, but there still is that chance that you will miss this. And then that could be very serious, have very serious complications for the patient. Um you know, if when we're talking about clinical features here, if the presenting complaints point to a true vertigo, so things like short onset or short uh, duration of the vertigo, uh, make worse with movement, improved with fixating on a single point, um, then we kind of use our history and physical to focus on ruling out the central causes. So we really are looking on our physical exam. Are there any focal uh, neuro deficits? Do we have any spontaneous vertical nystagmus? The other one is rotary nystagmus as well. So horizontal nystagmus is okay. Anytime you see vertical nystagmus or rotational or uh, torsion or rotary nystagmus, whatever you want to call it, I'll have a video of that here in a second. Um, that's very concerning. Uh, 
patients who are unable to stand unaided, one of the biggest things you can do, one of the best neurologic tests you can do for a patient is get them up and walk them. If a patient has difficulty walking uh, because they're falling to one side or they don't have strength enough in their legs to stand up, that's a, a very big red flag that this could be something neurologic. And then if they have um, persistent headache plus vertigo, then we're thinking more of like a cerebellar hemorrhage. And if they have neck pain plus, verti neck pain plus vertigo, then we're thinking something more along the lines of vertebral artery dissection. Uh, this is a great chart and it'll you'll see it pop up a few more times uh, in this presentation. But basically what you're doing here, and I'm trying to move this out of the way. Uh, basically what you're doing here is you're looking at this patient and you're saying, okay, I already know that this is vertigo and it's not near syncope or lightheadedness. So we're talking about vertigo. We're talking about neurologic deficits here. So our, we have our neurologic symptoms and our deficits are, um, are, or, are or were present. If the answer to that is yes, then you go down and you go immediately to your stroke workup. So you go ahead and get your CTA head and neck, your CT head without, maybe an MRI, probably getting neurology involved and then admitting the patient for further evaluation. Or if the patient has significant headache or neck pain and is unable to stand unaided and or is unable to stand unaided, any of those, you're going down here. If the answer to those is no, you say, okay, my patient has vertigo, but they don't have any neurologic deficits. There's no significant headache, no significant neck pain, and they're able to stand on, uh, able to stand without difficulty. Then we choose one of the following, you either go left or right, right? This is your kind of decision tree here. So the next thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, are the episodes short or are they prolonged? If it's short episodes, less than two minutes of vertigo and is initiated by head movement, and there's no ongoing or continuous vertigo, there's no spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus, then the next thing that you do is called the Dix Hall Pike test. Um, and I have a video of that here in a second as well. If it's prolonged vertigo, um, then we're going more into what's called the HINTS test. Um, has anybody ever done or heard about the HINTS test before? Do y'all know what that is? No? Okay. Here. So basically what that stands for, it's, a, it's an acronym, stands for Head Impulse, Nystagmus, and Test of Skew. All right. And I have some videos of this as well, but we will talk about what that is and why you only want to do it in these patients here. Uh, you do not want to do hints testing in a patient that has short episodes of vertigo, only in the prolonged ones. Because the problem is, is if you do a hints test over here, the chances of it coming back abnormal are very high. And then you're going to end up shooting yourself in the foot and having to do a much bigger workup than you really want to. So uh, that's that's where we're at there. Now, um, as we go down here, if we do that Dix Hall Pike testing and you get some of this um, vertical upward and rotary nystagmus, that means there's a positive Dix Hall Pike. You've now diagnosed them with BPPV. That's what that means. And then you can do the Eplin maneuver potentially to fix them. Over here, if the, negative, if the Dix Hall Pike is negative, then you can consider other diagnoses. There's also like vertical canal BPPV, um, uh, and then there's, uh, you know, the um, uh, the other, like other causes of like mini air disease and all that kind of stuff too. Um, over here, if the hints testing is positive, so if they have positive, and we'll talk more about that in a second, then you will say, okay, we're concerned about stroke and we're going to go ahead and do imaging. If all four of them are unremarkable, if the hints test is negative for everything here, then we call, then we can go ahead and diagnose them with that other most common condition, which is vestibular neuritis. Again, kind of a more benign diagnosis there. Um, so that's the basic gist of this slide. And then we'll talk more about it as we go along here. Um, has anybody ever performed a Dix Hall Pike test? No, okay. So it's a it's a it's a pretty easy test to perform. Um, basically, it's I'll show you on this thing here. Will let me see if I can. Um, here it is, right here. Let me see if I can play this. To perform the Dix Hall Pike test, select a stretcher or bed which has access on both sides. Position the patient on the bed so that their head can be extended over the edge of the bed. 
Have the patient turn their head 45 degrees to one side and then quickly lower them so that their head is extended 20 degrees over the edge of the bed. Observe for vertigo and nystagmus. You may gently lift their eyelid to help observe for nystagmus. After 15 seconds or so, if no nystagmus has occurred, return them to the seated position. Okay. And then turn their head to the opposite side and quickly place them supine with their head extended and again observe for nystagmus. Okay. Oh, two. So that's what the Dix Hall Pike test is. Um, and basically, what you're looking for, as you hear him mention in the video, he talks about observing for nystagmus. But also, if you are able to uh, uh, provoke the vertigo again, that's also a positive Dix Hall Pike, right? So if you're doing this and you're kind of laying the patient down with their head kind of turned towards the left and they get a positive response, then they've got positive BPP or their BPPV is being caused by and is stuck you know, otolith in that left side. It's the, the affected ear is the downward ear, if that makes sense. Um, and then it's again on the other side, if it's, you know, if, it, if nothing, if it's negative on the, when they're turning their head to the left, lift them up, turn their head to the right, do the same thing. And this time, if it's positive, then it would be the right ear that would be affected. Um, so that's what the Dix Hall Pike does. And it helps us to determine that this is BPPV. Um, and the treatment for that technically would be the epilene maneuver. You can also get things like meclizine and all of that. The biggest thing here again, though, is do not perform that hints exam on the patient. And you'll, it'll make more sense here in a second why I say that. So the epilene maneuver, it can be performed twice in the emergency department. If, if it's unsuccessful, then you instruct them to do it at home and you can give them a referral to ENT. I'm not going to waste time right now talking or showing you the video on how to do the epley maneuver. Just know that there are plenty of YouTube videos out there that if you ever want to attempt this on somebody, you can. Uh, just make sure that you're doing it with your attending involved and you know, kind of informing the patient, hey, we can do this, but there's a potential that this could make your, your, um, your vertigo worse. It's the same guy who does it. His name's Peter, Peter Johns. Um, and he has these same videos up there. Uh, and so it's, it's an easy one to Google. Um, so if they have a purely horizontal nystagmus on Dix Hall Pike testing, or if they have none at all, then you can also perform the supine head roll test, uh, which could indicate then a horizontal canal BPPV. The epilene maneuver is not indicated there. You can also have these other maneuvers and stuff like that too. Again, just be aware that those exist. Really not super important here because again, I, I never, almost never perform that, these maneuvers anyways. Uh, and I'm gonna continue going on here. All right, so then we get on to the HINTS exam. Remember, when we're talking about the HINTS exam, this is on the other side here. These are the patients, you perform this on the patients that are uh, experiencing prolonged episodes of vertigo. Uh, the Dix Hall Pike is for the patients who have 20 seconds to two minutes of vertigo episodes. The HINTS exam is for patients that are experiencing hours of constant vertigo and it doesn't go away. So again, it stands for head impulse test, nystagmus, and test of skew, H-I-N-T-S. Um, and, then, um, and then you also, the HINTS plus exam, if you use that plus sign, it's a bedside assessment for any new hearing loss. That one's really difficult to assess for it's some people have hearing loss and they don't even know, but one easy way is just rubbing your fingers together on either side of their ears and seeing if, if they can hear, you know, both sides. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to try to assess for any kind of hearing loss. Um, and again, this is used to help us distinguish peripheral issues like BPPV um, from central disorders like strokes in patients that have this continuous vertigo. So, uh, for, uh, nystagmus, um, let me see if I've got it. Oh, I do have it. Okay. I'm going to get out of here just a second and I'm going to show you. So the, the, the nystagmus that we care about, remember patients with horizontal nystagmus, um, are okay. It, things like alcohol intoxication, ketamine use, 
any other drug use, those can give you a horizontal nystagmus. And some people just have horizontal nystagmus at baseline. So we don't care too much about a horizontal nystagmus. The ones that we do care about, though, are the uh, these like vertical nystagmus or a rotary nystagmus. Those are usually abnormal. Those usually signify that there's something central going on. Uh, but even in vestibular neuritis, you can have a rotary component. Uh, and the, the affected ears use the opposite ear to the direction of the nystagmus. So if you have a nystagmus and it's, you know, it's beating this way to the right, then the affected ear is probably on the left. So to show you a quick video of a rotary nystagmus, this is actually a patient that I had in the emergency department. Um, and you'll have to, I'll play this a couple of times, but watch this eye. I'm not making her look anywhere. This is just her at baseline. And she actually is having a posterior circulation stroke. Watch this. Okay. I'll play it one more time. So that's that's what a a posterior circulation stroke kind of that rotary nystagmus that or a vertical vertical nystagmus that's what you're most um, concerned about there okay um, so that's the end of hints exam then we get to the test of skew so what test of skew is is basically you're having the patient look at a fixed point usually your nose and then you're covering up one eye, uh, and then you quickly switch, you tell them, okay, look at my nose, and then you quickly switch your hands and cover up the other eye. And you watch to see if their eye moves at all. If, if in a normal patient, when they're looking at with somebody who's not having a stroke, they're looking at your nose, their eyes should stay fixed because your, your, your brain accounts for that. In a, in a patient who's having a stroke, then they can have this phenomenon where they have to, their eyes have to kind of readjust to stay fixed on that one point. So watch this real quick. Okay, if you look at the camera, look at the camera. You see how they're readjusting? It, and it, he kind of, you can see there, it kind of readjusts. So this is, that's a, that's a positive test of skew. And that means that there, we would be very much more concerned for a posterior circulation stroke, a central cause of vertigo, okay? The next one is the head impulse test. Now the head impulse test is weird. This is the reason why we don't do the HINTS exam in people that um, have the short kind of 20 second to two minute uh, episodes of vertigo. The reason is, is because in those people and in you and me, all right, like any other normal person, if you do the head impulse test on us, the head impulse test will be negative. And a negative head impulse test makes you concerned for stroke, makes you concerned for, for stroke. A positive head impulse test is actually reassuring because it means it's more likely to be vestibular neuritis. So if you do, like if you were to come into my, do a head impulse test on me right now, my head, my head impulse test would be negative, and then you would be forced to go down the stroke pathway, even though I'm not even feeling vertigo right now, right? Um, so the negative head impulse test is bad. A positive head impulse test is reassuring for vestibular neuritis. That's this is where it gets a little bit confusing here, but that's why we only do the HINTS exam on people who are experiencing prolonged episodes of vertigo. And here it is. So basically what you'll see. Nice and loose, okay. Keep looking up my nose and keep your eye open. That didn't happen there. Watch this one. There, you see that? Keep looking up my nose. No, it didn't happen there. See that lag? Look at my nose, okay? Let's push on this one, okay? Right at my nose. There. Look at my nose. Look at my nose. There. Okay. So basically what a head impulse, the head impulse test is, a positive head impulse test is 
when you place your patient's hand, like this, uh, it always makes me think you're going to like break their neck, right? It looks like that kind of like that broken neck move. Um, but when you are, when you're doing that and you're doing uh, their, their eyes to you or me, when you do this, our eyes will not lag. We'll be able to focus on the nose. And as soon as you jerk our head this way, our eyes will immediately track. Okay. And in a stroke patients, they will also continue to immediately track. In vestibular neuritis, though, they're going to lag. And that's a positive head impulse test. Does everybody understand that? I know it gets a little bit confusing there. Um, that's kind of a, that's probably the most confusing part of this lecture is the negative head impulse test bad, positive head impulse test as reassuring for vestibular neuritis. Okay. And then, of course, the acute hearing loss in the Hintz Plus exam, the rubbing the finger and thumbs together, central cause would be concerning for that. Um, okay. So, but treatment of uh, vestibular neuritis is purely symptomatic. You give them some nausea meds, you give them some vertigo medication, so maybe some Zofran and some Meclizine, something like that. Treatment of stroke is much bigger, right? We're talking about admission. We're talking about neurology consult. We're talking possible TPA here. So you can see why it's such a big deal for emergency medicine physicians to be able to differentiate between those central causes like stroke versus those vestibular neuritis causes versus more peripheral causes like BPPV. All right, I'm going to pause there for a second. Are there any questions so far? Okay, good. Um, all right, so... We're back to this. We're back to this chart again. So again, patient has vertigo. They have neurologic symptoms, or they have really bad headache, or they are unable to stand unaided. Then we go immediately to our stroke workup. A uh, patient doesn't have any of those things, but they're having short episodes of vertigo, lasting less than two minutes, um, and they don't have any like concerning signs of nystagmus here. Then we go to Dix Hall Pike testing not hints. We don't do hints on these patients. And then depending on whether they're positive or negative on their Dix Hall Pike, we can kind of determine where, where that peripheral cause is coming from versus those patients, again, that have prolonged vertigo episodes. We do the hints exam on those. If any of the hints exam ex things are, are concerning, so a bidirectional nystagmus or a rotary nystagmus or a vertical nystagmus, or that skew deviation, that vertical test of skew, or they have a normal or negative head impulse test, or they have new hearing loss, any one of those, you go immediately go, yeah, it's hence positive, stroke, we're going to our stroke workup. Or if they're all four of them are unremarkable, meaning that you just have maybe a unidirectional horizontal nystagmus, your skew deviation is not there, they have an abnormal hits, hints exam, or uh, abnormal head impulse test and no new hearing loss, then you can be reassured that it's vestibular neuritis. But they all four have to be uh, present in order for you to make that diagnosis. Otherwise, you're again kind of going more towards this stroke work up here. Does that make more sense now, this chart? Yes, I do have a question though. Yeah. Like even if you have like the short bursts of um vertigo and you do the dix hall pike and it's negative and you're looking at like the other causes i see it's like the vertical roll um maneuver next if that's like abnormal or um negative do you like go to like the stroke protocol and put them in a scanner and go from there or how does that proceed if the things are negative on the other side of the chart it really it really depends Sometimes they it just it, they just won't have a positive Dix Hall Pike, but you're still pretty reassured by their neurologic exam. You're reassured by the fact that the episodes are are positional in, in nature and they go away within two minutes. In, in my experience, at least, it's I've never diagnosed a stroke in somebody who has intermittent vertigo, like those kind of really short episodes of vertigo. Now. That's not to say I haven't worked people up for it. If you know, it depends on the rest of their exam and their history. You know, if it's a really old person who has a lot of risk factors, I may just go ahead and put them through the scanner anyways and kind of just do my due diligence there. Um, because this is, of course, in a perfect world, they would be able to tell you exactly ex how their vertigo is. But a lot of times you'll get this mixed picture. They'll say, well, I'm a little lightheaded and I'm a little bit vertiginous and I've 
got these, you know, so it's all, it's kind of all over the place. So okay. but yeah, Thank it's you. a great question. It's, it's, I would say the majority of the time, I don't care too much, even if they don't have a positive Dix Hall Pike, but sometimes I do care if that makes sense. So the approach to diagnostic imaging in vertigo. Um, so if you're diagnosing with BPPV or vestibular neuritis, nothing. You don't need any any imaging whatsoever. If you're concerned about stroke, you get that CTA head and neck uh, to look for acute clots, uh, or you know, and see if the patient needs thrombolysis or an endovascular clot retrieval. But we usually admit these patients in order to get MRIs done. Um, and have them kind of followed overnight. And then all these other things for things like vestibular migraine, you don't really have to have any imaging there. If it's a vertebral artery, artery dissection, again, we're doing CT angiography of the head and neck. Uh, TIAs, we do a, the same thing like a stroke. Suspected TIA, same thing like a stroke. Meniere's disease, nothing. That's, again, peripheral cause. If you have a suspected cerebellar hemorrhage, you're doing CT of the head. Uh, if you're concerned it's maybe MS, then you're admitting them for maybe an MRI. So again, it just kind of depends on, you know, what you think here. But it, if you're concerned at all about any kind of stroke or they're having any kind of neurologic deficits like a TIA or anything, then you're doing that stroke workup for them. This is a kind of a list of a bunch of different anti-emetics and anti-cholinergics and, um, uh, and different like uh, medications that will help sometimes with vertigo. Um, uh, that you can give. I want to find, I think the, uh, so here under antihistamines, you've got meclizine here. Okay. Uh, the other one that's really interesting that a lot of people don't think about is that benzodiazepines actually can be used to help with vertigo as well. Valium is a great one um, that, that, you know, I'll, I'll usually start off with meclizine in the emergency department and see if that helps. If it doesn't, usually my second line drug is going to Valium or Diazepam and seeing if that helps. Uh, it can, and it can, it can, it usually does. It usually helps a lot. So those are the two most common ones that I use for vertigo in the emergency department. All right. And then other causes of vertigo, um, you have vestibular migraine, uh, which is the most common cause or central cause of uh, vertigo, but it usually goes underdiagnosed here. Um, it's what we call more of like a lot of times you'll hear this called like a complex migraine. Um, and what you'll do here to treat this is you'll usually just do like your migraine cocktail. So we'll do things like, uh, you know, IV fluids, Benadryl and Reglan or IV fluids, Benadryl and Compazine and maybe some Toradol or something like that. And usually once you've treated that headache, the vertigo goes away. So don't forget about vestibular migraine. It can be um, an easy one to treat and then the patient feels way better and you can send them home. Uh, mini airs, I've kind of alluded to this a couple of times. This is where you have increased endolymph within the cochlea and in those labyrinth. Um, it's usually unilateral, the sudden onset vertigo, sometimes has some nausea and vomiting and maybe some diaphoresis. This is one where it's kind of this middle ground where you'll see like episodes that can last seconds and to minutes all the way up to hours. And so you'll sometimes get this, you know, these patients that come in, you're like, I don't know, should I work this up for stroke? Should I not? I'll tell you this, if the patient is having hours worth of vertigo, I'm usually working them up as a stroke. Again, because it's it's so hard sometimes to differentiate here. Um and there's really not a great way to say, well, it's just Meniere's disease. Uh, you know, the the hints testing may or may not be positive here. Um, so it's just one of those that a lot of times when they're having prolonged vertigo, I'm more likely than not going to at least evaluate them for stroke. And while I'm doing that, I'll be managing them symptomatically, seeing if I can get them to feel better. And then depending on what I find and how they're doing, I may admit them or let them go home, depending on how the patient is doing. And then there's a ton of other ones too. So you've got perilymph fistulas, very rare, vestibular ganglionitis, again, very rare. This is probably the one that you need to worry about the most is ototoxicity. So anybody that's coming in for vertigo, you need to ask them what medications they're on. If they've been taking anything like aminoglycosides, think about like your azithromycin and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's one where it's an easy diagnosis. Oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I just got diagnosed with pneumonia. I've been on my Z-pack for the past couple of days, and now all of a sudden I'm having this really bad vertigo. 
uh, and I'm having some hearing loss with it. Okay, that's probably some ototoxicity. Although again, I'm sorry, that should be L-O-S-S. I do know how to spell. Um, but the, you know, for, for this, if they are having hearing loss, you're gonna have a really hard time convincing yourself to not do a stroke workup on these patients. Even if you do find a reason like an aminoglycoside, anytime somebody comes in with a new hearing loss, it's really concerning for stroke. Um, and then of course, a post-traumatic vertigo. So patients who are suffering from concussion uh, or something like that. And then there's this Wallenberg syndrome as well, which is a lateral medullary infarct of the brainstem. They'll have some ipsilateral facial numbness, loss of corneal reflex, Horner syndrome, so that loss of sympathetic stuff and then paralysis of the soft palate. Again, here, that's going to be really concerning. You're going to, you're going to examine this patient and be like, okay, there's definitely something going wrong here. It's going to be hard to miss that. All right. So a summary of vertigo. Um, and again, make the patient define their dizziness. Um, if they don't describe it as room spinning or feels like I'm on a boat, then consider other causes. So if they're sitting there and saying, oh, my dizziness is actually me feeling like I'm going to pass out or something like that, then go down that cardiac pathway. You know, get your troponin, get your EKG, get your chest x-ray, do some orthostatic blood pressures, all those type of things. Uh, and then um, you can, um, uh, you know, can maybe avoid having to worry about the neurologic pathway here. All right. That's all I've got on, on um, vertigo uh is there are there any other questions or you know anything that you're still confused about um, that i can answer otherwise we'll get you all out of here early get y'all hopefully everybody can go to bed early tonight <laughs> I don't have any questions. If anyone can think of anything, if not, thank you, Dr. Kendall, for taking the time to give us this lecture. It was, again, fantastic. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to give it to us. Yeah, you're very welcome. Just, you know, final thought here is that when you are going in to see that patient and they have that chief complaint of dizziness, the first things first, make them define it, tell, make them tell you what it is, and then start thinking about this chart here. And okay, is it prolonged or is it not? And then that'll really help you um, kind of be a little bit more comfortable with figuring that out. Well, guys, thank y'all so much. It was good seeing y'all again. And uh, Dr. Kevin, can, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. I wonder if you could expand just a little bit on the ototoxicity and defensive medicine because you made the comment like you it's gonna be hard for us to talk ourselves out of a stroke and into you know like you present the amino glycosides or something like that kind of what's your approach and and what's your comfort level with that so i use a lot of shared decision making with my patients right so if this pay if i had a patient come into me who just was on a Z pack for a pneumonia or whatever it might be. And, and they are telling me that they've got some vertigo and then they're having a little bit of hearing loss and stuff. I, and, and let's say that this has been ongoing now for a couple of days, right? A lot of patients won't come in initially for this. So they're outside the TPA window anyways, they're outside any kind of intervention window uh, for as far as like going in and clot doing clot retrieval or embolectomy or anything like that. I'll have a, a long conversation with them in the room saying, hey, look, your history is really telling me that this is probably due to ototoxicity from this medicine that you are on. I would expect that your symptoms will get better eventually, but there is also a possibility that this could be some sort of a stroke, You know, that this could be something that we need to be looking at more and not just sending you home to follow up with your primary care doctor. And you know, what are your thoughts? Are you really concerned that this could be a stroke or are you feeling okay to go home and follow up with your primary care doctor and they can continue looking at this as an outpatient? And you'll see that there are, there are you know, a good amount of people out there who'll be like, you know what? I'm fine. I'm, I'm just, I just wanted to get it checked out, but I totally get it. I just want to go home and I'll see my primary care doctor. I'll have an MRI done as an outpatient. I really don't want to be admitted to the hospital. And then in my chart, I'll sit there and document, you know, inform, 
patient and I had a conversation regarding this. I informed them of my concern of possible stroke and that we could admit them for further evaluation and treatment. However, the patient declined, stating that they'd rather just follow up with their primary care physician, blah, 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 blah. And then that protects you somewhat, right? Um, and again, the best way to prevent things like lawsuits is communication. So you have communicated with the patient. Uh, and if they end up having something, then they can think back on that conversation and be like, well, the doctor did say it could be this. But again, there's nothing that can be done for it, you know, since I waited so long to come in. So it's no big deal, you know. Um, whereas if the patient's like, you know what, doc, I'm just really concerned. It could be this, but I'd rather just come in and, and be admitted. Then it's an easy admission and it's an easy workup uh, in the hospital. Uh, and then everybody is, you know, is pleased with the care. So I definitely hear what you're say saying about defensive medicine uh, there. But I think all, everybody in emergency medicine practices some form of defensive medicine depending on what your experiences have been with patients in the past uh, and the the risks that you inherently take when you send patients home and how comfortable you are um, with those risks. Does that answer your question? That does. That's great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, that was a great, great question. All right. Well, Dr. Kendall, do you mind uh, dropping your email in the chat? Of course, yeah. Um, students have additional questions. Yes. I will. So I'm just going to give you my Texas Tech email. TTUHSC.edu. Um, and then I'm going to give you, I'll put my cell phone number in there as well if you ever need anything. Sometimes, with that, with easy that email address, I usually check it like once a day. So if there's ever anything that you're, you know, you're on shift, you're like, hey, Dr. Kendall, I'm going to send a video of you of this nice diagnosis or whatever. That'd be great. So although oh. don't violate HIPAA, please, you know, get permission <laughs> and all that. So, yep. Well, great uh, chatting with you all and, and talking to you and um, wish you all, all the best. And I'll see you all again next time. Yes. Thank you so much. Yep.